I'm Garrett Brown. I invented the study cam, which is a way of operating handheld without the shake that you normally get. Uh, humans are wonderfully mobile creatures. We walk, we run, we climb stairs, you know. What I tried to do was allow us to do all that and hold a camera. And it actually went a little beyond that, You're not only holding it as if it was close to you, but holding it out fingertips, you know, so it can move through space in a, in a nice way. Study cam involves an arm, which does the heavy lifting for you. This is a spring-loaded, never gets tired mechanical arm, right? And it involves a camera. Right now, we're just using a camcorder and a heavy weight cage to approximate the weight of a professional, professional camera. But it's, it's an object that just acts like there was no gravity. It floats, right? And as I was saying, this is the way that you have control over this through space, just almost as a fingertip operation. The camera is balanced on a gimbal. It's counterweighted. It's on bearings, and you know you can shoot anywhere from you can shoot anywhere from to the rear and around yourself, and so on. So when you're being a point of view, you're moving sort of like a person, but without this bit, you know, because this would look really stupid. So you're moving a little bit like a person. You're looking. You're hiding behind stuff. You know? It doesn't matter whether the camera is big or small. Mercifully, they're getting smaller. This is a study cam for camcorders called the, the Merlin, you know, and it, you don't need the big mechanical arm. It's still a gimbal, you know, and as cameras shrink and they're getting really good and really small, this can do the same thing that that big rig does, right? Um, they've even shrunk down to the point now where they make one called the Smoothie is just being released for uh, iPhones, you know, or it flips or something. So your iPhone goes on the back of it. It actually makes a great little study. Um, my dream would be if cameras shrink down so that they almost could be like a contact lens and then we don't have to lug all this stuff around, you know. But that may take another few months. I had just actually come back from shooting The Shining for Kubrick and was extremely well practiced, you might say, because Stanley does a lot of takes. So I was in good form for uh, Brian and Blowout. And um, I was asked to do something that I never did on The Shining, which is a point of view. And a, the study cam happens to be terrific for a point of view because uh, the aforementioned walking and running and moving like a human is is allowed, right? With one exception, the weird thing is that you can't you can't walk. We walk like this, right? But we're not conscious of it. We're not. Uh, we don't think of ourselves as moving up and down when we walk. When we picture our walking, it's smooth, right? Uh, and so you have to restrain yourself from being too accurate when you do a point of view. The camera is acting like the person, right? Uh, up to a point, you know, not some of our, you know, knee-jerk kind of unconscious moves, but the camera kind of acts consciously like a person. So I was excited. I wanted to do a great point of view. I was obviously aware of the shot in Halloween. Um, you know, it was, it was groundbreaking. It was fun. From my point of view, fresh off Kubrick, it was not that well executed. It was, it did a lot of this, which humans don't do. You know, have you noticed that? N unless you've been at the bar too long, we don't, our point of view doesn't roll, you know, so I wanted to do a great one. I wanted to do one that really felt like a true human. And we had all the fun stuff, you know, hands entering with knives and hands opening doors and opening showers and so on. And when I got on the set, I was extremely disappointed to find out that I wasn't doing a good one. I was doing a parody of Halloween. I was doing a, a crappy horror film. You know, it's not easy to be bad, after, particularly after Kubrick. So every part of it went against the grain for me, every aspect of it. Having to be too obviously out, you know, where people could have seen me, you know, moving like clumsily as if I was, you know, every footstep showing, you know. I'd love to go back and redo that as if it wasn't a, uh, a crappy horror movie. And that was the surprise, of course, for the audience that what started looking like something not quite 
impressive suddenly turned out to be deliberately unimpressive. But I got there, and um, De Palma had clearly thought out what he wanted. There was no arguing about bad versus good. I mean, I was to be this, you know, parody. Um, and every aspect of it, in my memory, was pretty well planned. Um, I hadn't worked for Vilmos before, was quite pleased about working for him. Uh, obviously pleased to work for Brian. And we did it in my memory. Of course, my memory is always remarkably few takes, but uh, we, did it in, we did it fairly briskly. And uh, it contained a lot of different elements, as you, as you see. The mirror guy was great because he does a little turn and I, my camera has to turn at the same time. So the most fun part of it was choreographing the, the various hands coming in. I did knife hand. Uh, somebody else did door and shower hand because that was on an awkward side for me. All in all, it's you know a great fun bit of filmmaking for its purpose. And uh, it was a really fun night to do. We rehearsed as a, you know, a continuous action, obviously. I don't remember whether Brian used storyboards at that point or not, but I know that every moment in it was, was scouted, planned, and knowing what I know about him subsequently, I'm guessing that it was all pretty, cut, you know, pretty sorted out. Um, obviously, it was lit for exactly what happened. Um, the actors were all very well rehearsed. Um, they were doing things that are quite absurd, you know, when you look at it again. These two girls, you know, in diaphanous costume are dancing facing the window, which they would never do. Of course, that's they're facing us, the bad horror film audience, you know. Uh, but it, all that they did was, was rehearsed and choreographed. What the hell is going on in here? I'm trying to study for a final. Yeah, we have finals too. Do you ever hear a lot of dance? Are you going to turn it down or do I have to go to Sue? I'll go to Sue then. Fuck off. I'm going to Sue. And as always, with a, a shot that goes on long like that, the tough part is to memorize the damn thing, you know? And um, the longer the shot, the more specific things that you have to commit to memory and get to and remember everything and so on. Um, in addition to which, you have to operate this instrument, which isn't light. We jokingly used to say it's like being a piano mover and being obliged to play at the same time. It's a combination of high effort and art, right? And it's a lot of fun to do, but, you know, it's not, it's not casual. Uh, you don't just stand around and do it endlessly. You want to do it and be done, you know? The difficulty, of course, is to learn the thing, and I try to do that without camera first, commit it to memory. And in this instance, the, the easiest way to do it is to pretend to be that dim, horror, scary, knife-wielding guy. You know, so, so learn a point of view shot as if you were the party doing the looking. And in some ways, what you're learning to do is to see stuff, you know. And seeing it means that your head is somewhere it should be. Your instinct, in this case, to duck when somebody's looking at you has to be restrained because scary, dim, horror, knife-wielding guys don't s seem to think they're invisible, you know. You know, I kind of got into being a, a really dim, scary, murdering guy by the end of it, you know, so I was sorry when it was over. You know, those conventional, you might say, study camp shots are on view, particularly toward the end of Blowout. My friend Danny Lerner did wonderful shots chasing uh, Travolta through, oh, across the piers in Philly and down near the river and in, under the fireworks and up the stairs and so on. Um, and that originally was what people thought of as a study camp shot, kind of a, a cliched running shot, you know. And it was very pleasing to me that we quickly got to the point where we realized that, you know, it isn't just a stunt camera, it's, you know, it's, it provides another dimension for, you know, conventional working a set, indoors, outdoors, you know. Brian uh, has used the study cam really well over the years. My friend Larry McConkie was his principal, it was and probably is his principal operator and he's a magician with the thing. And they have made shots that I just admire tremendously uh, in films like Carlito's Way and Snake Eyes and so on. And they are not sh shots that you as an audience would go, ooh, study cam, you know. 
They're simply movie making shots. They're omniscient third, you know, God's director's eye view shots that take the lens where it's supposed to be, but just with more freedom, fewer restrictions. Don't have to stop at doorways or stairs or steps or outdoors, you know. Um, that pleases me enormously. I mean, you can imagine how much fun it is for me to see a great shot, you know. Or to contemplate the work of somebody like Brian who understands this thing and uses it like brilliantly, you know. I love that. I modestly would have to say that the study cam has been well used, has been a, a boon to all kinds of filmmaking. Um, if you're careful with it, it looks like a dolly shot. Think back, not very long ago, we had to put a camera on wheels to move it. Now we have tremendous freedom of all sorts, this study cam being part of it. And uh, <clears throat> it particularly liberated the camera from mechanical sort of moves because wheels do tend to be in a straight line and jibs and dollies and so on move in a more robotic kind of way. Once you see it in your fingertips like that, you have something that can make these weird French curves that would drive a dolly grip, the guy who pushes the dolly, crazy, you know? But the point is, that's maybe the optimum place for the lens over time, you know? It's not just here and here, but is creeping up like this, you know? It's approaching, it's, it's coming at you, it's stopping with a tremendous amount of emotional wallop of some sort. For example, this kind of a move, is very different, you know, than this kind of move. And as always, it's the stopping and the starting that's much more interesting than the move itself. And you can start and stop a camera moving in an infinite number of ways, you know. And so when you finally translate this to a point of view, filmmakers Get, you know, can get excited about that because now there is no break in continuity. You can continue like a person. You can, you can have, to coin a phrase, a point of view as a point of view. You can have a, you have an attitude, you know, and you can display the attitude, you know. All of this is such a joke in the context of this red herring of a fake shot, but, you know, you can tell that the real thing is something I still love to do. I've been very lucky because after a while people began coming to me and saying, how can we do this? How can we get the camera to follow a swimmer underwater or drop with a diver or something like that? And those are fun things to think about because there's so many damn restrictions associated with the Olympics and money restrictions, obviously, in the real world. And the fun part is to contemplate a challenge like that and figure out the one and only way that you can do it that's the simplest, cheapest, that doesn't mess up the look of the place, doesn't make a racket, doesn't create a stench, or whatever else might get you chucked out of there, you know? Uh, and the other thing is, in most cases, the best motive for inventing something is if you want the thing. I mean, I was a little filmmaker. I, I had a dolly, I had a light camera. The look of that camera, 12 pounds on an 800 pound dolly, was so absurd that I, it sent me looking for some way to get rid of that, you know? Um, and wanting it is e extremely useful if you're inventing because at least you have a clue when you, you know, what it is that might satisfy you, you know? I wanted to, I wanted to be able to fly over football games, with, you know, in that huge space that was not used. Um, to get the lens close to players instead of way off at the sidelines telephoto. You know, when you're close, you have this wonderful wide angle effect where you actually sense that their head is closer to you than their feet. <clears throat> you see them much more as players on a chessboard and dynamic figures rather than shapes that are moving and clashing and so on as, as in telephoto. And uh, that led to this thing called Skycam, which flies over football games. So. Um, one, one form of calculation would have me batting a thousand with those things. But of course, that doesn't take into account the bin of whims and the wall of shame in this place where all the crap that doesn't work is hanging, you know, that nobody gets to see, so.
Okay, room tone. <laughs>